Architecture Codex. If you want to see more, like, comment, share, and most importantly, subscribe. Today, if you want to know what time it is, you probably will check your phone. Some people still wear expensive watches because Rolex. But 10,000 years ago, you would probably just look at the sun to see how much daylight was left. Somewhere in between, there was time provided as a municipal service. This was done by local governments long before they ever provided sewers, water, trash collection, or emergency services. And perhaps the most famous example is the Rathaus Glockenspiel in Munich, Germany. Every hour in the Marienplatz in Munich, the clock on the town hall tolls the time. But then at certain hours, there is an animated spectacle exhibiting clockwork movement, including dancers and jousting knights. This is a relatively new timepiece dating back to 1908. The building itself, not much older, is a romantic revival of medieval design by architect George von Habarissa, with the town section completed in 1906. But the Rathaus Tower Clock and Glockenspiel exemplifies a tradition of hundreds of years of the cities in Europe, where the town, the local government, adorned its municipal center with a clock tower, the same way churches would have bell towers. There have been different methods to mark time throughout human history. Gear-driven clocks can be traced to the Greek mathematician Archimedes in the 3rd century BC, whose clock was powered by weights and floats in water. China had water-powered clocks around 1000 AD, where the water flowing into containers provided the weight for the gravitational force to run the clock. Around 1200 AD, Europe had clocks with weights pulling down on the gears, using gravity again as the source of the energy to drive the mechanism. Coiled spring-driven clocks were introduced in the 1400s. By the 1600s, Galileo's pendulum was controlling the timing, but the clock was still generally weight-gravity powered. In the 1800s, we saw electric-powered clocks come to the general public. Then, quartz-driven clocks and watches became popular. By the middle of the 19th century, we had the incredibly accurate atomic clock but it is still not something that every household has. Most clocks and watches prior to digital timepieces had some sort of face with hands for the display and some form of oscillator whose action governs the measure of time. There's a lot more history regarding the innovations of clock and watchmaking that you can get elsewhere. The main thing to consider is that human history evolved needing a better way to tell time and simultaneously devising ways to tell time more accurately. At one point, sunup or high noon was insufficient, so they began to enumerate time segments such as the third hour, and at this point, clocks might have just an hour hand. We would still then get phrases such as quarter of or half past, but when more accurate measures were needed, they added the minute hand, so you could say things such as 1007 or 242. Standardization of time became more essential with railroads when they needed to set schedules and know exactly the time in each city. With digital timepieces, we began to measure how long it takes for someone to swim a lap of a pool to the thousandth of a second. And frankly, if the difference between first place and second place is down to a couple thousandths of a second, I think they should just declare a tie. While much of Europe had striking clocks, bells that would ring at certain hours in the church steeple, Face clocks began making an appearance in the latter part of the 13th century. In the early 1300s, the Medici built their municipal offices in Florence, now known as Palazzo Vecchio, the old house, and by 1353, there was a face clock on its tower. The Grosse Horloge is a 1389 astronomical clock in Rouen, France. Designed by Jourdain de Lèche and Jean de Filaine, it has been modified and moved since its original fabrication, and it currently does not tower over anything. So its purpose as a civil timepiece was mitigated. 
In the 1920s, it was electrified, so the original clockworks are not functioning. In Prague, by the end of the 1400s, their original clockworks by Mikulos of Caden was expanded by Hanus of Rus to include a face clock, an astrological clock with figures of the apostle appearing at the hours. The clock in Venice's Piazza San Marco dates back to the 1490s. Designed by father and son Gian Paolo and Gian Carlo Ranieri, this clock has many different levels over an arch entry into the square. It features automaton figures banging the bell with sledgehammers. On Epiphany and Ascension Thursday, a trumpeting angel leads the three wise men in a procession. This clock has each of the 24 hours of the day on its face, instead of just 12 hours, as most clocks have. In 1530, Bern, Switzerland built their Zeitglog. Like other machines and clocks, it has undergone changes and restorations. Placed on what was once a much older gate to the city, it announced the official time of the city in a manner like a flight attendant giving you the local time of the airport where you just landed. The quarter hour bell is rung by a gilded animated figure striking it with a hammer. London's famous Big Ben, which is actually the name of the bell in the clock tower, was built in 1859. The tower was designed by architect Augustus Pugin, but the clock was the design of Edward John Dent. When completed, it was the largest four-faced clock tower in the world and became the symbol of London. Clocks on municipal buildings continued to be installed throughout the world during the 19th and 20th centuries, although eventually they became mere affectations rather than a necessary service. As recently as 2012, the Abraj al Bait Hotel in Mecca, designed by S.L. Roche, Gomb, and Dar Ahadasa architects, has the world's largest and highest four-face clock at 187 feet in diameter. It is atop of what is currently the fourth tallest building in the world. I doubt if you can read the clock from across the Red Sea in Sudan, but maybe that was not the objective. It is so large in a world with so many methods of telling time, it is almost a parody of itself. It is illuminated with LEDs and lasers, and the clock flashes at set times for the Muslim call to prayer five times a day. And perhaps not as romantic as the sound of the Adhan, the call to prayer, but it is a thing. Back in Munich, the clock on the top of the tower was designed by and here I'm about to pronounce a lot of German names, so bear with me. Back in Munich, the clock on the top of the tower was designed by Job Harek and constructed by the clockmaker Philipp Ho Hotzinger. The automatons of the clock were designed by sculptor George Petzold, the woodcarver Anton Brioschke, and the clockmaker Johann Manhart. The figures are intensely painted copper, assuring that they are lighter than they look, but they do need to get repainted often. In the animated story, we see a depiction of the famous and long wedding feast of Bavarian Duke Wilhelm V and Renata of Lorraine. Duke Wilhelm started the famous Hofbra House a few blocks away, so the guy knew how to have a party. The feast took place in the Marienplatz below and featured jousting knights, as are depicted in the clockworks. Below the animated knights is the dance of the people who make barrels, known as coopers in English, but in German it is called Schaffleerstanz, which sounds so much more cool than barrel makers dance. That 15 minute spectacle traditionally occurs at 11 a.m., noon, and 5 p.m. At 9 p.m., a smaller show occurs with just an angel and a night watchman appearing. So how do the inner mechanics of the glockenspiel automatons work? Well, it's not automatic, like the small figures you might see on a cuckoo clock coming out to greet each other. And it is electrically powered, although today the source of the power are solar panels. After the clock bells chime, someone has to press the start button and manually switch songs and set figures in motion, all from a fifth floor control room. 
Some of the controls operate the eighth-story music cylinders, which are much like giant music box cylinders, with each pin striking a bell of a particular pitch. Different cylinders are used at different times and for different religious seasons. On the tenth floor of the towers are 43 bells of the clock carillion, which are activated by the mechanical cylinders two floors below. The glockenspiel, then, is an intriguing mix of machine, man, and German punctuality. There is a crew of ten that take turns operating the clockworks, as well as doing the preventive maintenance. Since the clock is exposed to German weather, it suffers from a lot of deterioration due to the freeze-thaw cycles, and will require screws to be tightened or electrical contacts to be brushed clean. Today we are jaded by mid-century Disney animatronics and more recent robots that may make this clockwork mechanism appear to be quite quaint. But that's okay. It is still an intriguing idea that the need for a standard time in a town fostered the clockmaker's talents to go beyond telling just time, but also telling a story. As a latecomer to the tradition, the Rothhaus glockenspiel may have been the last such clock constructed when it was necessary to establish time as a municipal service. Here again we see it's necessary for today's generation to embrace the design and technology of the past in order to preserve it. And no one is talking about replacing such wonderful clocks with digital timepieces just so they can appeal to a generation that cannot tell time on a face clock or read or write cursive or even tie their shoes. So it's kind of nice that we can hold on to something from history and enjoy something quite literally from time past. I'm Michael Molinelli, and this is Architecture Codex. Thank you.